Hello, this is a short video on electromagnetic waves and how they relate to the atom. Um, so you'll see kind of how they fit in with our current topics that we're talking about here with atoms. So the way that light fits in has something to do with a problem that Rutherford was having with his model of the atom. It didn't explain the way that electrons moved around the nucleus of an atom. And so the problem is... Um, we know from physics that uh, electrons being negatively charged should be attracted to the nucleus, which is positively charged. And so the question was, why, if this is the case, does the electron not just go kind of spiraling into the nucleus? There wasn't a really a good explanation for this, or how the electron was moving, or what was going on with any of that. Um, and so they had to kind of think up something about the way that electrons worked. Um, this is where Niles Bohr came in, and he was actually a student of Rutherford, so he worked with Rutherford pretty closely. And something that he did was he made some observations with light, uh, and he used that to create his idea of different quantized energy levels. And so I'll kind of explain that here. And so before we talk about that, you have to kind of understand what light is, or what electromagnetic radiation is more specifically. Um, so, electromagnetic radiation travels in waves. There's a lot of different kinds of it, which I'm going to talk about here on the next slide. But basically, it, it's what's called a non-mechanical wave, which means it doesn't need a medium and it can travel through space. All right. Um, and inside these electromagnetic waves, we have a par particles that we call photons. And what a photon is, is it's like the basic unit of light, like a, an individual piece of light. And so... What you can kind of think of it is here is like a little packet of energy or a little packet of electromagnetic radiation. And when you think radiation, you think like really scary sorts of things. Um, a lot of these types of radiation are actually very, very mild. They're not things that would hurt us in any way. Um, so uh, as I said, I'll talk about that. But they're made up of these little tiny photons, uh, and that's, that's kind of the way it works. There is wave-like behavior, okay, because it travels in waves. But there's also particle-like behavior, and as I said, I'll kind of talk about that. So here's some things. The first thing is uh, I want you to know the general order of these waves from low energy to high energy. So the lowest energy electromagnetic waves are radio waves. And so these are really pretty long. And so they can be on the order of, uh, you know, a meter 100 meters, something like that. So they can get, the radio waves can get really, really long. So there are these long, low energy waves, just really, really long, low energy waves. Um, and then as the waves are getting a little bit more intense, you get what are called microwaves. You should be familiar with that from like the microwave oven. The microwave oven has uh, a device in it which sends some really concentrated microwaves into your food. All right, and then infrared comes after that. Infrared is kind of similar to what we would think of when we think of visible light, but it's not visible to us. Some different things like mosquitoes can actually see infrared light, but we can't. Um, and then there's the light that's visible to us. So that's this red, orange, yellow, uh, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Roy G. Biv is the acronym for that. And so um, I want you to know Roy G. Biv if you don't know that already. And then we go higher energy is ultraviolet. With ultraviolet, you'd be worried uh, about, say, like sunburn and things like that. Having ultraviolet light, it can damage the skin. X-rays, X-rays go right through your skin. Um, and so if you were exposed to too many X-rays, you'd develop cancer. Um, but fortunately, like usually when we get an X-ray, it's just for like just the shortest moment. They uh, shoot your arm with X-rays and then they take a picture, and then they stop shooting it with x-rays, and hopefully you shouldn't need too many x-rays in your life, but it's getting to be a really, really high energy, um, kind of bad for you type of radiation. And then gamma radiation is like the super intense, really bad for you sort of radiation, that if you're exposed to too much gamma radiation, you, you'll almost surely develop cancers, things will happen, it's bad for your health, so like avoid the gamma rays. So the order again, it goes... Radio waves, microwaves, infrared, and then the visible light spectrum, which is Roy G. Biv, and then ultraviolet, X-rays, and gamma rays. What I like to do is I like to sort of chunk the section of it that is infrared, and then the visible light, and then the ultraviolet, because it goes infrared, 
and then red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, ultraviolet. All right, so if you see there, there's like a chunk there where it kind of makes sense all together. Um, so we go radio waves, microwaves, infrared, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, ultraviolet, x-rays, gamma rays. All right, that's the order from low energy to high energy. There's a blank here in your notes also where you should copy down. Um, the higher the energy you have, the longer the wavelength and the shorter the frequency. All right, so the longer, uh, the higher the energy that you have, the longer the wavelength, but the shorter the frequency. So long wavelength, like the radio waves, super long radio waves, like a meter or a hundred meters or something like that, very low energy, hardly anything at all. But when we get to the gamma rays, um, you know, it's super high energy, very, very small wavelengths, very intense. Um, and then the frequency, if it's at a low energy, it has low frequency, but long wavelength. If it's at a high energy, it has high frequency, but short wavelength. All right, so that's kind of how that works. Those are how those are related. With the visible light, you can see here that um, the ultraviolet light, which is, or sorry, the violet light, which is like the high energy light, has really, really short wavelengths, whereas the red light, that, that's the longer wavelength light, the lower energy light is there on the bottom. So that's kind of how that works. Okay, so now how does this have to do with the atoms, right? We've been talking about light this whole time, but we haven't gotten back to the atoms. So this is how it works. Electrons within an atom are at uh, what we call a ground state. The ground state is sort of like the most stable place for the electron to be. It's where the electrons like to be, all right? However, sometimes energy can come in, and it comes in the form of heat or other light particles coming in, or uh, electricity can make this happen. And what it does is it excites this electron up to a higher energy state. Um, if you remember from the electron hotel analogy sheet, um, things like to fill the bottom first. They like to be in the low part of the energy. If, if you can have a low energy electron, that's where it wants to be. It doesn't want to be up at the high energy level. And so we say that it gets pushed up into this excited state by like fire, heat, electricity, um, even really intense light can excite an electron up. All right, but it doesn't want to be there. So I say it's an excited electron, but it's excited sort of like someone would be if they'd be chased by a bear. You know, it's like high energy. It doesn't, it doesn't want to be that way, though. So it's not like you're going to Disney World. You know, you're excited and you're happy. This excited state is excited, but it's not happy. It's, it's, uh, it's bad because it wants to be at that ground state. It wants to be where it's comfortable. And so after you excite an electron up to an excited state, what it wants to do most is go back to its ground state. And so that it does as soon as it, as as soon as it can. But when the electron falls back down to the ground state, uh, we have to follow what's called the law of conservation of energy. So the law of conservation of energy says energy can't be created nor destroyed. So what happens here is as the electron falls from that high energy state back down to its um, low energy state, the electron is losing energy here. It has to put that energy someplace else. It can't just disappear. And so as the electron loses energy, it emits a photon of light that has the same amount of energy as what it lost. So to keep everything equal, as the electron is falling back down to its ground state, it emits a little photon of light that has some energy. So this is just uh, summarizing that same, same process, right? Atoms absorb energy in some way through heat or light or electricity, the atom will absorb energy, um, the electron becomes excited, then I kind of think two and three go together as well, okay, so then the electron will fall back down to its ground state, and as it falls down to its ground state, it shoots out a little electron there, all right, and so this is what what's happening. You can have some high energy photons or low energy photons, and I'll talk about that here on this next slide, and so imagine we've got the same thing, right? Um, and, you know, they had some different thoughts about this, so there are two possibilities. Basically, one possibility is that this electron could only be excited to certain levels. Uh, the other possibility is that the electron could be excited up to any, any level. As the electron is excited to these different levels, all right, and it's releasing these photons, the higher the 
energy it is when it's excited, the higher the energy of photon that it releases. And so if you think about it, based on what we said earlier about different energies with light, if the electron is only excited a little bit, it might emit a red photon of light. But if it's excited more, higher energy, it might emit a green photon of light. And if it's really, really excited, all right, and it falls back down to its ground state, it might emit a violet photon of light. Okay, so you can see how those are getting higher energy the more excited the electron becomes. And so, as I said, um, we kind of have this idea. Uh, I'm actually going to jump forward really quick here and talk about something um, and then jump back. And so, there are a couple possibilities here. Either the electrons are um, excited to any state, okay, in which case we'd get all these different colors coming out, or they're only excited to specific states, in which case we only get specific colors of light that come out. You see this with the continuous spectrum and the emission spectrum that are shown here. Okay, so if electrons could be excited to any state and then they would fall back down, we'd get something that looks like a continuous spectrum with all different colors of light included. Um, but what we actually find is that we get something that is not a continuous spectrum. So I'm going to jump back here. What it, what it finds is that atoms uh, can only excite um, electrons to certain levels and so only certain photons are produced and we say that means that there are these specific energy levels the electrons are excited up to all right and that uh, these energy levels are quantized because only certain values are allowed and so that's what quantized means is that only certain energy levels are allowed to try and think about quantized I tell people like think about a case where you know only certain numbers are allowed uh, I like to use the example of eggs if you go to the supermarket and you buy eggs, there are only certain amounts of eggs that you're allowed to buy. All right, you can buy six eggs or 12 or 18, but it kind of comes in sixes like that. All right, you can't go to the supermarket and say, I want to buy two eggs. They just don't let you do that. So you, you have to buy them in sixes. And so in this way, eggs are kind of quantized into groups of sixes. You buy six or you buy 12 or you buy 18, but you can't buy anything in the middle. And so that's called quantized. To avoid a misconception though, things that even just come in ones are quantized. So our age, like our legal age, is something that's quantized because we go from say being 16 years old to being 17 years old just right away. Uh, legally speaking, we don't ever really say we're 16, uh, 16 years and two months and five days old or anything like that. All right. Um, we are 16 years old and then all of a sudden we become 17 years old. It's not a continuous process. You're, um, you know, legally speaking, it doesn't matter. It just matters whether you're 16 or you're 17. Um, something that's more continuous be would be kind of like your height. You're getting gradually taller every day. And actually our height changes as we go through the day. So all these different heights are possible. All right. So you can be, um, you know, five foot four inches and three quarters of an inch tall or something like that. Um, and then your height changes throughout your life and even actually throughout your day your height is changing. So we have all these different values that are possible for height. And there's really no limit. You know, if you got a really, really precise ruler, you could measure your height to a very, uh, very specific or very precise level. Um, but uh, age doesn't go like that. When we're talking about our legal age, it is you know, 16 and then it's 17. So age is quantized, height is continuous. Uh, we find that the light that comes out of these atoms is quantized. Only specific levels are possible. And so I kind of talked about this, but we get these distinct line patterns in light that are produced by these different elements. And they serve as kind of like a fingerprint for the element because they're unique. Each element kind of has its own colors of light that are produced. And based on that, we can identify what the different elements are. So I have a picture here of some different spectra that exist. By the way, spectra is plural for spectrum. Um, different spectra that exist for these different elements. And so this shows, because of the photons of light that are produced, it kind of shows where the specific energy levels exist for these different elements. Uh, and that that's largely what Niles Bohr was working with. Um, 
So he went through and he found, um, he said, basically there are these orbits for the electrons, all right, and there are these specific energy levels, and um, the way that they go through these is by absorbing and releasing energies, and they bounce back and forth and things like that. And he came up with some math to try and explain it, uh, and the math actually worked out, but it actually, it only worked for hydrogen, and this was kind of the limitation of Bohr's model. We saw these specific line emission spectra, but Bohr could only get the math to work out for the hydrogen atom. And the hydrogen atom is actually very simple because it only has one electron in it. Basically, once we started adding extra electrons in, the math of Bohr's model worked out. There was The math of uh, Bohr's model fell apart. So we still know that there are these specific energy levels, and that carries on into the modern model, but it took de Broglie and Schrodinger to come up with the more complicated mathematical equations that we use in our modern model uh, to figure things out. And so Bohr really was limited mathematically to only talking about hydrogen. But there are still these specific energy levels, um, and that does continue into our mo model today. Uh, Bohr just hadn't figured out the math of all that yet. All right, so that is that. Um, again, I know it's pretty quick, but if you have any questions about how light works and how it interacts with our models of the atom, make sure that you come in and ask. Um, otherwise, uh, good luck.